Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. God is good. I'm Pastor Ryan. Welcome to all of our guests. I, I want to make sure I introduce myself because I, I heard uh, I met some guests last week and they didn't know my name. And so I was like, you know, make sure you know, we have so many guests coming in. I just want to say welcome. Welcome to Calvary and just trust that you encounter God in a real way today as we always want. And I trust that you come hungry to know the truth of God's word as well. And because uh, we believe in the truth of God's word today. And we're in Jonah chapter two, and I titled this the God of second chances. And I want to introduce you to a man who's, who's gotten a second chance at life. His name is Michael Packard. He's going to be on the screen only, though. He's not coming here to Delaware. Um, but Michael Packard is a lobster diver in Massachusetts. And on June 11th of 2021, um, he was suddenly swallowed by a whale and lived to tell about it. And uh, so it does happen. And he was just diving for lobsters, and all of a sudden, he felt a nudge or a tug, and then he was inside of this large fish. He didn't know. He actually thought it was a great white shark, so he was relieved to find out later that it wasn't, that it was actually a whale. He estimated he was in there for about 40 seconds or so, and he was wearing scuba gear, and the whale didn't like him in there, and he was accidentally swallowed the, you know, marine biologists and scientists are saying because of he was the whale was going for krill that was all around him and so he got swallowed accidentally with the whale um, but anyway the whale spit him out and he lived to tell about it um, but that's not all because like I said God's a guy of second chances and uh, Michael Packard also was in a small plane crash I believe in Costa Rica if I read that correctly and survived to tell about that as well. So I'm sitting here thinking, this guy, God's trying to tell him something, or maybe he knows God, and so God's sparing his life, but if he doesn't know God, I want to go hang out with him in Cape Cod and tell him, hey, God's giving you, you're running out of lives, you know? Make sure you're ready, just in case. So I just wanted you to see that it can happen. It can happen, that someone can be swallowed by a large fish or a whale, and we're in Jonah, and obviously many people know the story that Jonah was swallowed by a large fish. Now, why would he be in this fish? Because in Jonah chapter 1, he decided to uh, rebel and disobey God's call in his life as a prophet. A prophet is someone who is a messenger for God, who will speak for, for, for God to a, a nation or a person. And Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because they were the most wicked and evil city in his eyes that he would not want to help at all. He knows that God's a merciful God, and if they repent, that they would change their ways, that God will spare them from the coming destruction. And he doesn't like that at all. And so he actually, instead of, he's in Joppa, instead of going to Nineveh, he decides to go to Tarshish. Just to, just to get that across one more time, let me show you this, this graphic, this picture of what we mean by rebellion. He's supposed to go to Nineveh and he's like, peace, I'm out, I'm going to Tarshish. I want nothing to do with this plan of yours, God. And it's on his way to Tarshish that God brings a storm to get his attention and he's sleeping and the pagan sailors who don't believe in one true God, they're scared, they're crying out to their gods. And so they, they wake, um, Jonah up, they cast lots, they figure out God sovereignly figures, uh, makes it a point that Jonah is the one that's guilty of this. Jonah admits to it, which is good, and he acknowledges that God is the God of, of land and sea, so this is definitely my God doing this. And so he says, throw me over and it will stop. Now, the, this, is, this is what's beautiful, is the Nineveh, um, I'm sorry, the, the pagan sailors that are from Tarshish, uh, most likely Phoenicians, they show more mercy than Jonah does because they try to paddle to shore uh, in this really bad storm to spare his life, but they can't do it. It's just not working. And so they decide to throw him over, but they wanted God to make sure that, you know, God don't, don't hold us accountable for his death. He's going to die, so we're going to throw him over. 
And so Jonah is thrown over, the storm stops, the pagan sailors worship God because they see obviously he is in control and he is greater than their gods because their gods weren't answering. And Jonah, we, we pick up today that Jonah is in the water and we read last week that Jonah was swallowed by a large fish. Sounds like a magnificent story, doesn't it? Maybe a movie or a tale, but it actually happened. In Jonah 1.17, let me read this uh, for you to start us in Jonah 2. Verse 17 of chapter 1, though, says, Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. God had arranged for a great fish. I personally have no problem believing and a God who can do this. But this scripture comes under great scrutiny by skeptics and historians that like to discredit the Bible and try to discredit that it's valid, a valid story. Uh, they would call this more of a fable or a tale. But I personally don't have a problem believing that, uh, that our God does this because, well, God is all powerful. And he created us from nothing from himself, from his own words, he can obviously um, can take control of this, this fish and do what he pleases and even preserve Jonah's life. We already see that God can control the storm, uh, the, the storm and the waves and the sea. We see that God can cause lots to fall on Jonah as the one who's the culprit. So why can't God control what he created that swims in the sea and that is a large fish? If I accidentally say whale, forgive me, okay? I don't want any emails to say, you know it doesn't say whale, right? <laughs> like, I know, I know. It's just, it just seems like it's a very large fish, and I think about whales when I think of large fish. So he's in this large fish, and he's in there for three days and three nights. Now, just so you understand, in the Hebrew culture, that doesn't necessarily mean literal 72 hours, Okay, one rabbi in 100 AD to explain about the time Jesus was in the grave, he says this, a day and night make a whole day. And a portion of a whole day is reckoned as a whole day. So in other words, the sun's up at five o'clock, right? Soon it won't, soon, it, soon it'll be around five. We don't see the sun anymore, that's sad. Well, if if someone, if Jonah was swallowed at five and then that night he's still in the whale, or I mean the fish, then that is considered in the Hebrew culture one day. Do we, do we follow me? So when people get hung up on, well, how can someone survive 72 hours? Or when we get hung up on the, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ, uh, they actually don't look at it as a perfect 72 hours. They're looking at it as portions of three days as long as there's a daytime and a nighttime. Does everyone follow me there? Good, so why do I say that? Because it says he was in there for three days and three nights, but this correlates with Jesus. Uh, we have no reason to believe this isn't true story. This isn't a true story because Jesus himself talks about Jonah's event, Jonah's, this real life event himself, and Jesus validates it. So go to Matthew, chapter 12, and, and we're going to start in verse 38, and I'll have it on the screen for you as well. Matthew chapter 12, just so you know, when it comes to uh, anything, when Jesus talks about the Old Testament, any, any scripture from the Old Testament, Jesus is basically validating the authority of that scripture and that story. One of the, one of the strongest ways that we prove the evidence of God's word is, is Jesus and what he says. And what we're getting ready to read is Jesus affirms that this event actually happens, literally. And so let's read what he says here. Uh, Matthew 12, verse 38. One day, some teachers of religious law and Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to show us a miraculous sign to prove your authority. Now, why would Jesus say this, or why would they say this? They, they wanted to prove that Jesus, you know, wanted to see, does he really have the power 
to be uh, God in the flesh or the Son of God. And we're going to see that Jesus requires faith more than anything else. And he says here in verse 39, but Jesus replied, only an evil, adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he literally says this happened. When you break this down, this wasn't a figure of speech. Verse 40, for as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Well, did Jesus die on the cross and then go into the grave and then come back out alive? Yes, we believe that happened. And we have evidence for it. We have, I mean, there's books and books and books that show that the church changed and something definitely happened around this time in our history. We even have changed our timeline in world history to Mark BC and AD, the life of Christ. So what really happened, and when Jesus rose again, he validated Jonah's story because it was a sign for Nineveh, now it's a sign for us today. Verse 41 says, the people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it, for they repented of their sins at the preaching of Noah. Now someone greater than Noah is here, but you refuse to repent. Wow. Jesus is like, it's like I'm Nineveh, or I'm, I'm Jonah right here in Nineveh, in Jerusalem, and I'm trying to tell you, I'm right here, believe in me. The sign is in front of you. But the only sign I'm really gonna give you then, if you can't believe the miracles that I've already done, the last one is gonna be my death and my resurrection. It's gonna be just like Jonah. He went into this fish and he came out alive. So I personally don't get caught up uh, in this because I believe God can do these things. I believe God is all powerful. He's omnipotent. He's a miracle worker, and God could preserve Jonah's life. And the problem with the getting caught up in it is we miss the actual message of the story. The message is Jonah should be dead, but God spares his life. And God is a merciful, gracious God because Jonah rebelled and was disobedient, and God still chose to spare his life. That's the point of this story, not necessarily the, the validity or credibility of this scripture or story. But in fairness to those who have good questions, and I appreciate good questions, I just want to give you a little bit of evidence of how we know this actually happened. I will say as I study this prayer, uh, we also see that Jonah doesn't focus so much on the fish, and that would be where the tale would kind of be, you know, exaggerated. Jonah doesn't do that. Jonah talks more about the water and the ocean and his situation. Jonah actually mentions himself a lot. So he's definitely thinking about himself here and what he's going through with this personal, um, this personal situation that he's in. And we're going to read Jonah's prayer, but it's, it's really a prayer of thanksgiving because God has spared his life from drowning. But it's also a prayer of thanksgiving because he spared from this, uh, from, being, from dying inside of this fish. So let's go to verse one of chapter two. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. Now I stop there because this entire ordeal on the boat, Jonah is never seen praying once. And then when he gets to the worst situation, what does he do? He prays. <clears throat> well, you know what? It's never too late to pray, is it? I guess if you're gonna get, if you're gonna have to be swallowed by a large fish and go down to the belly of death into the ocean and then you finally pray, well, at least you did it, right? <clears throat> Would God want us to pray before that? Yes. Jonah waits to pray until things get absolutely desperate. Uh, did he, did you, do you think Jonah wrote this inside the fish's belly? I don't know if any of you have seen some of the pictures of Jonah sitting at a table with a candle, <clears throat> penning the words of this amazing psalm slash prayer. That's fake, just so you know. There was no Ikea to be found. And if there was, it would take him longer than three days to put the furniture together anyway. 
in the dark. So we believe, and most scholars believe, that he waited to pen what he was praying afterwards when he was on land, and that makes more logical sense for me. But if he happened to have some papyrus and some ink in there, perhaps he did. The point isn't that. The point is these are the words that he was praying, and this is the moment, the come-to-Jesus moment, so to say, for Jonah. And he says in verse 2, and just so you know, the first two verses are a summary of the entire prayer. So he's just summarizing quickly what happened, and then he gets into more detail as we read on. So verse 2, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I call to you from the land of the dead. The word here is Sheol, which is the word we also use for hell. So he's in this pit of hell, in his opinion. He's in this death. He's going to die. But he cries out to God, and God hears him. Church, it's never too late to call out to God. I'm just saying this now, even though we're going to hear about this more and more as we go on. When you get into a situation, whether it's physical death or whether it's something where you've disobeyed God and you've run away, God would rather you cry out to him than stay silent. I talked to so many Christians who have told me I couldn't even be with God. Like I couldn't even talk to him. I couldn't read my Bible because I was so ashamed of my sin and my disobedience. And so I didn't want to be with him. I didn't want to connect with him. And I hear what you're saying. But what we hear right now is, is Jonah was very disobedient. He was on the brink of death. And what does he do? He calls out to God. Do not be afraid because you will find a merciful God on the other end of that prayer. You will. Be encouraged. It, it, it is Satan telling you not to do it. it. It's your shame and your own flesh going, there's no way. No one else accepts me. No one else loves me. No one else forgives me. So I might as well not reach out to, for any kind of help or prayer. But the reality is God loves you. And he knows everything you've ever done and everything you ever will do. And he still loves you. Do not listen to the enemy. Do not even listen to yourself. God wants you to be with him. He wants you to return. And then Jonah goes into some specific details of what his situation was like, and it looks very dim. It, and he gets poetic. He does. He says this in verse 3, You threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Notice that. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Jonah is acknowledging that this is God's doing, that this is God. God's behind this. He's acknowledging God's sovereignty in this situation. God has put him in the ocean, but Jonah has willfully decided to go into the ocean for the sake of these uh, sailors and God's behind this whole situation, and he realizes and he knows that God is sovereign in the midst of it. And then he says this in verse 4, Then I said, O Lord, you have driven me from your presence. Whoa. Stop for a moment. You have driven me from your presence. Not only that, but Jonah ran from God, didn't he? <clears throat> There's no worse place to be than a place where you feel like you're far from God's presence. The, the reason why hell is so bad is because God's not there. That, that's, that's hell. Where God isn't present, that is a terrible place to be. We, here on earth, this is not hell. It's, it's getting bad though, isn't it? I'm just being real. I'm not trying to discourage you today. I'm not trying to make you leave here feeling all negative or anything like that. But it is, it is getting rough in our world more and more by the day. But can you imagine if God pulled his grace from this planet, what it would be like to? Can you imagine if he pulled his church from this planet, what would happen? Can you imagine if God's love wasn't on this earth, what this world would be like? It would be hell. There is no worse place to be than to feel like you're so far from God. I remember Jesus on the cross. He said, 
God, God, why have you forsaken me? This is how Jonah feels too, but it's in his own doing. His own doing, he's in this position. And he feels like God is far. But then he has this this muster of faith, so to say, and he says, yet, or the word could be used, but, but I will look once more toward your holy temple. Even Jonah knows that even if he feels so far away from God, it was his, it was his doing but that he could look one more time to the temple of God. And this is what the Jews would do, the Israelites. They would, wherever they were, they would face the temple, their face being towards God. It was a way to worship with posture that they're facing God's holy temple. So the physical temple here is what he's thinking of. And so he's facing, he's, well, he doesn't know his moorings at all. He has no idea if he's looking east, north, south, west. He's just saying, I'm looking towards that holy temple again where you are. And he worships him. He's trying to say that. It's an act of worship. And then verse 5, he goes further. I sank beneath the waves and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. That's how far down he is in the water. I was imprisoned in the earth whose gates lock shut forever. In other words, this is bad. He's not getting out of here. They're locked and shut forever. It's impossible to be saved. And then the amazing but God verse that we see so often in scripture, verse 6b, but you, O Lord, my God, snatch me from the jaws of death. Doesn't that remind you of Ephesians 2? God's mercy and grace, but God. I know we can kind of hear that so much, but we have to understand something. Um, Jonah was dead. And we are dead in our sin without Christ. We're doomed for eternity. But Jesus comes and he breaks down that prison, that that just completely has imprisoned us in sin, those gates, those, those shackles of sin, that bondage completely broken by the power of Jesus Christ on the cross and the grave. I don't know what situation you're in. If you're online or in this room, I don't know what situation you're in. But I'm telling you, there's no other power to look to than the power of Jesus Christ. In the first service, someone gave their life to, to Jesus, rededicated her life during the first service online. So we don't take for granted those who are online or those in this room, but someone said, I could recommit my life to Christ today. We got the message already. Praise God. Just know that you can have a but God moment right now because he loves you that much. He made a way where there was no way for Jonah. He made a way. And verse 7 says, as my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord. I wonder what he remembered. I want to say that he remembered the mercy of God, that God could get him through this. I want to think he did that. I don't know. We don't know for sure. But he remembered the Lord, the goodness of God, the mercy of God, his faithfulness. And that's why he called out to him. He says, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. In this one, or in your temple, he, this one is the heavenly temple. So he's looking to God in the heavenlies. And he's saying, I'm all the way down here and my prayer reached you. And then he goes into verse eight through nine. So now we hear how bad the situation is, but yet what God is doing for him and in verse 8, he says, those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies. Jonah knows full well that turning to false gods and idols will bring no deliverance, no person, no money, no earthly power, no knowledge or wisdom. Nothing outside of God can deliver us. It's God's mercy or it's death. He's saying here that those who worship idols, rely on idols, 
they turn their backs on the mercy of God. Isn't that ironic? Because Jonah turned his back on God, and yet God is showing him mercy. But once more, Jonah looks towards God for that mercy. Jonah is acknowledging here that it would be foolish to not turn to God in times of trouble because you will actually find mercy and help. Can I tell you something real quick? Too often we look everywhere else instead of God. We must stop. There is nothing in this world that's going to save us other than Jesus Christ. Even our physical present troubles in our world, everyone's looking horizontally towards some, some leader or, or money or medicines or some kind of uh, peace treaty and all those things, they haven't lasted. It breaks my heart to see us so desperately looking for some cure for humanity and it's not here on earth, it's only in Christ and Christ alone. You can get overwhelmed looking at all that's going on in our world right now. Overwhelmed. There is no easy answer about it. There's, no one's going to come up with a good answer. Because the answer already exists. And our world is like in the belly of a fish. I mean, right now, here's the thing. Here's the situation. Right now, our world is drowning in sin. Drowning in despair and hopelessness. We're drowning towards death. And every waking moment that we have where we're still breathing is God's second chance. And we must get on our knees as a church and pray that for our own life, but also pray for our world. Because our world must turn once more and look at God for deliverance and salvation. And God will continue to allow things to get the way they are until we humble ourselves and repent from our wicked ways and turn back to him. He will allow this to happen. I'm sorry to tell you that. I hope you know this, but there is no salvation coming that's going to fix all this stuff in our world. God is allowing it to happen to get our attention as believers, even more so as unbelievers, that no matter who you turn to, if it isn't me, you will be in this situation and it's going to get worse. And we're not even talking, I'm talking about spiritual too, but people aren't even thinking spiritual things. They're just thinking the physical. But eternity is even greater of an issue. I'm a little passionate about that because I'm seeing the, the, the fires and and the earthquakes and the floods and the wars in Afghanistan right now and the sicknesses and the famines, the, the fire in Siberia is larger than all the fires in the world combined. That's crazy. The earthquake in Haiti was devastating. What is going on? Our world is is drowning in every moment that we have. Our world needs Jesus, and every moment we have, they need to call out to him. And, and here's the thing, we can also be the messenger like Jonah, but we can't turn our back from the task. God was sending Jonah because he saw their grave situation like us right now, what we're seeing, that's what God was seeing in Nineveh. And so he was sending help. He was sending someone to plead with them to turn. We must do that right now. We must ask God for the courage to talk to our neighbors, our coworkers, and our friends, and also to help people in need. They need to know the truth. No hope or answer or deliverance is coming outside of Jesus. There is none. There is none. There is none. There is none. I don't know how to help people understand that. Uh, we don't live forever. This world comes to an end. Jesus comes back. He makes a new heavens and a new earth. That is the Bible. That is what's coming. And, and people need to know the truth. There's too many false hopes, too many false promises that, that this is all going to get better. 
and it's just going to be a new issue tomorrow. My heart grieves for our world. And let me get more positive real quick. Because <laughs> Jonas says this. Because he knows he's done. He should have died. But instead, God spares his life. And because of it, he says this. But I will all. This is from the belly. He already knows that God has, has been there for him. He has his faith that he's going to live again. And he says, but I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise. Notice I will, because he's still in the belly. So he can't sacrifice the whale or the fish before God. He has to sacrifice a proper animal for an offering. So he's in there saying, I will. When I get out of here, I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise. But he doesn't just do the ritual. He, he says, I'll obey you. I'll worship you with my obedience too. And he says, and I will fulfill all my vows. That's a lesson for us, church. We can't just give lip service. We have to live. We have to live. We have to. So when he gets out of this situation, he's going to offer sacrifices and he's going to fulfill his vows with his life because he says, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Nothing else was going to save him. It's obvious that God loves me so much that he sent this great fish to save me, to spare me one more time. The God of second chances has given me a second chance. And so I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. And so in verse 10, it says, then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. Here's the bottom line. Jonah's story isn't to show us how bad Jonah was but to show how good and merciful God is. That's the point. If we're, if we're honest, we know we don't deserve God's grace. We know we've messed up. And, and so we already know that we've gone wrong in times in our life, and, but we know that God is so good and merciful. That's the point of this message. And that we would be done if it wasn't for Jesus. And this is the same for us today, that God is... God's mercy is offered to all people through his son, Jesus Christ. One of the writers said this, the belly of a fish is not a happy place to live, but it is a great place to learn. <laughs> Jonah had to learn. Jonah needed some time he needed to, first of all, see God's mercy in action for his own life. He needed to see God's mercy for his own life to change his heart. And then he needed some time to think about what he has done. And he did. He got it. And it was when he changed his heart that God had the whale or the fish, the large fish, spit him out onto land. And so we're going to read next week what he does with that. But please know this, the only reason Jonah had a chance to change is because God showed extravagant mercy providing a fish to save him. We have the chance to change today. Is that you? You have a chance to turn back to God. His grace is here right now. He loves you. Our world has a chance to turn back to him. I'm praying they will. So let me apply this in closing with this. What do we do when we've run from God? What do we do when we've run from God? What do we do when we've disobeyed or rebelled or, or sinned against God? We see in this story, uh, first of all, just, just know this, please, that we actually see a different order in this story. God provided his mercy of of holding Jonah before he actually turns his heart and changes. Do we, do we, do you, like that's amazing. In other words, God was giving Jonah a second chance to repent and to, to walk out or to swim out or whatever, crawl out of this fish, crawl off the shore and go do what he's supposed to do. God didn't have to do that. 
God did not have to send this fish. Jonah could have drowned that day. So just so we understand, God spares people so they have a moment to change. Are you following me? That in itself is amazing. And in this moment, number one, here's the first thing. What do we do when we run? Noah recognized the severity and consequences of his rebellion. So we should too. Because he said, Lord, I, I've been driven from your presence. Secondly, so once we recognize the severity of our situation and what we've done, secondly, we should look to God once more. We see that he turned his face back towards God. We, we read that he remembered the Lord. Go ahead and put that on the screen for me. So he looks to God once more, turns our faces back toward God. So we should do that, and we should remember the Lord. Remember how good he is. Remember how forgiving and merciful he is. Thirdly, we got to do something. We got to pray. We got to cry out to God because he alone saves. Why is that still important? Why is this so important? Because no one else could save Jonah in that situation. No one else can save us in our situations except God. Fourth, believe and receive God's mercy and forgiveness. Jonah had this recognition that if you turn your back on God, you will forfeit receiving mercy. So Jonah knows that he must turn back towards God because only there will he find mercy. So believe and receive God's forgiveness today because he forgives you. Just so you know. He loves you. And lastly, Jonah doesn't just have a change of heart. He has a change of life. And now we must return to living a godly life and give our lives as an obedient and living sacrifice. Uh, just so you know, we don't sacrifice animals anymore. Hopefully. Why? Because Jesus was that last sacrifice. The only way we can show God our appreciation for all he's done is to give our lives to serve him. And so Jonah says, I will fulfill my vows. In other words, I will go do what you call me to do. I will serve you. The only proper way that I can show God I love him, I worship him, is to obey him with my life to serve him. Not just to sing praises or make sacrifices, but to live in obedience to God. Have you been wondering, how can I serve God? Obey him. Do what he asks you to do in the Bible. Watch him do amazing things in your life. And by the way, I feel so connected to God when I obey him and when I serve him. I feel fellowship and connection with God. In closing, there was a verse that I read last week that I want to share with you. Psalm 119, 25. It says, I lie in the dust. Revive me by your word. You feel like you're in the dirt? We could also say, I lie in the depths of the ocean. Save me from this death. When I read that scripture, it encouraged me because whether it's you and God and your relationship, maybe it's some mistake you've made, maybe it's a sin that you've, you know, you've done and committed, maybe you've offended someone, you can feel really low like you're in the dirt. And it says here, I lie in the dust, revive me by your word. You know what's interesting about that? is God created us out of dust. So if he can create us out of dust, I'm pretty sure he can revive you from your situation today. But we have to understand, we have to realize if we're in that situation and we gotta, we gotta lean into God and what he says about us and his word. Let his word revive us. No other words in this world are gonna revive our souls. Only Jesus. Only he delivers. Would you close your eyes with me as we pray? Because in the first service, Alexandra gave her life to Jesus, recommitting her life, I should say, 
to Jesus. I don't know how far you've gone. I don't know if you've, how much you've disobeyed. I don't know any of that. You and God know this. Or maybe during this sermon, you were convicted by sin because the Holy Spirit is trying to save your life. Would you take a moment to say, God, I admit that I've run from you. I admit that I've turned my back on you. Forgive me of my sins. I turn back to you, grateful for Jesus Christ and what he's done for me on the cross and the grave. And now I will give you my life as a demonstration of my love and my gratitude for what you've done for me. In Jesus' name, amen. God, save today. And thank you that on the brink of death, you would save such a disobedient man that you would show so much gr grace and mercy because you want us to know this story today. Jesus overcame death for us. Jesus overcame our sin for us. And no matter how far we've gotten from you, if we call you hear the repentant heart, you hear our prayers. God, we pray for our world. Please, God, get our world's attention to turn back to you from the leaders all the way down. Lord, God, please, I pray that, Lord, they would get on their knees with us and that we would get on our knees and we would pray and we would cry out to you from earth to heaven that, God, you would spare lives from eternity in hell and that you would also bring mercy and peace here in so many dire situations. God, we call out to you from the depths of our heart and our stomachs. Lord, intervene, we pray. Thank you, Lord, that it's not too late. It's not too late. God, we are so grateful for your mercy for us. Thank you. You didn't have to, but you did because you're so good and merciful. So today we leave knowing full well that we have peace with you and that you have forgiven us of our sins. And we can leave here with joy, but our hearts also yearn for the salvation of our world. So we continue to pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church. Have a great day.